Hi, I'm Jim. It's great to be with you today as we go through this fourth study in this bundle, Who is God? As you've gone through this bundle, you've had lots of great studies that are really circling around who God is. Well, now finally we come to the end of this bundle and we're looking at another question. Is the Holy Spirit really a person? You know, most of us, we can relate with uh, understanding God as a father and, and even relating to him in prayer as, as a father. We can relate to Jesus. Uh, he's probably the easiest one for us to understand because we have images of him and uh, we see how he lived and walked uh, on the earth and related with other people. But for most of us, it's really hard to get our head around who is the Holy Spirit and is, is the Holy Spirit really a person, a person that I could have a relationship with? You know, one time I was teaching a religious education class, volunteering for my parish with a bunch of fifth and sixth graders, and I asked them the question, who is the Holy Spirit? And one of, one of the kids said, he's a pair of cleats, like football cleats. And it took me a couple of minutes to figure out what he was talking about, what he meant, but uh, he was referring to that passage in the scriptures where it talks about the Holy Spirit as the paraclete, which means the comforter, the counselor, <laughs> Uh, we all had a good laugh about that, but I mean, we, we understand like the Holy Spirit, it's hard to understand who he is. How do, how do we get our heads around, is the Holy Spirit really a person? Well, I want to take a couple minutes for you and your groups to talk about what do you already know about the Holy Spirit? When you hear the, the name Holy Spirit, what images come to your mind? What, what do you think of when, when you hear the Holy Spirit? Let's take a couple minutes for you to talk about that with your groups and then we'll come back. So what did you come up with? As you talked in your groups about the Holy Spirit and what, what you know about him, what kind of images come to your mind? I, I'm guessing that you came up with things like fire, a dove, wind. Uh, and, and the reason why is because those are symbols that we use for the Holy Spirit, even in Christian artwork. When you go into most churches, uh, one of the things that you'll see representing the Holy Spirit are images like that. These symbols are ways of representing the Holy Spirit for us, but they don't contradict who he is as a person. Remember that activity that you did at the very beginning of the study? You were looking at these significant historical figures like uh, Martin Luther King or Albert Einstein. And there's ways that we come to understand those people. We, we remember them because of things that they did, significant things. When you hear the words, I have a dream, you, you think of Martin Luther King. Uh, well, in the same way, when we see these symbols of the Holy Spirit, uh, they remind us of things that the Holy Spirit has done. And, and that's why the church uses them as symbols. If you, if you want to explore this more, in the Catechism, in paragraph 695 to 701, uh, it, it breaks open a number of these different symbols that the church gives us for the Holy Spirit. One of the best ways that we can come to understand the Holy Spirit and know who He is, is to understand what He did. So I, I want to take us back into the scriptures and look at a couple of key passages that really help us understand that. At the very beginning of the Bible, the first chapter of Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And right there in verse 2, it says, the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God moving out over the face of the waters. And then in verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the seas and over the birds of the air. Notice in that verse that God doesn't say, Let me make man after my image. He says, Let us. In the very beginning, in the creation, God is referring to himself as a community of persons. And then we see in chapter 2 and verse 7, after God creates man, what does he do? He breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. These passages become great glimpses for us of the Spirit, the Spirit brooding over the waters in creation and the Spirit becoming a critical part of uh, the creation of man, but understanding that God is a community of persons. You know, in one of the other studies that you did with Scott, he looked at the baptism of Jesus and we saw those three persons 
of the Trinity uniquely in the baptism. John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus, so Jesus is being baptized. The Holy Spirit is descending upon him in, in the form of a dove, and the voice of God the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son. So we see those three persons of the Trinity. It really helps establish for us, this is who the Holy Spirit is. He is a person. Well, what this study is all about is unpacking that and exploring that more. Who is the Holy Spirit, this person of the Holy Spirit? I want you to take a couple minutes with your groups now, and I want you to look at the index of the Catechism. Look at the section on the Holy Spirit and start reading through the entries that are there. there there's a lot of them, but notice in particular the, the section that talks about the Holy Spirit in the economy of salvation. What do you notice about all of those things that the Holy Spirit does? And then you're going to read in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, and we're going to talk about that scripture passage when we come back. That passage that you just read from Acts, that's a significant moment for the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit's fully revealed. We call that the Feast of Pentecost, and it's the birthday of the church, it's the beginning of our Catholic faith. We see in that passage the Holy Spirit comes down on the disciples and rests on, on them as tongues of fire. You know, that gives you images of the Old Testament. We, we have the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, where Elijah called down fire from heaven and it consumed the sacrifice uh, that, that he had on the top of Mount Carmel. Well, let's make a connection to those images. John the Baptist, who came in the power of Elijah, Scripture says, he says about Jesus that Jesus is going to baptize us in the Holy Spirit in fire. So we, we already have a precursor, almost a prophecy from John the Baptist that this is how the Holy Spirit is going to come. He's going to come like fire. And what does fire do? Fire transforms things. You know, you think about a piece of wood or a piece of paper, you throw it into a fire and the fire transforms it. It changes its form completely. We look at the Holy Spirit as an image of fire because that's what the Holy Spirit does in us. You know, all of this makes me think of an, another image from Scripture of the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the image of wind or breath. You know, we, we talked about the Holy Spirit in, in creation, moving over the waters and God breathing the breath of life into man. You know, those, those images of the Spirit, of the breath of God, right? Well, think about wind. Wind is really powerful. And when you, you can't see it, but you know that it's there because of its effects. And if we look at the Holy Spirit all throughout the history of salvation, we can see what the Holy Spirit has done because you can see evidence of that He was there. You know, he's, uh, He was a part of creation like we talked about. The Holy Spirit was with Abraham. The Holy Spirit was guiding Moses and the Israelites all through their journey. And then when we get to the New Testament, we see the Holy Spirit all over the ministry of Jesus. It was the Holy Spirit that overshadowed Mary so that she became pregnant and gave birth to Christ. And it was the Holy Spirit that moved, the power of the Spirit that moved through Jesus in all of his acts of healing and saving all throughout the Gospels. But finally, it was the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. You know, the Catechism talks powerfully about how the Holy Spirit has moved throughout the history of salvation. The Holy Spirit is at work with the Father and the Son from the beginning to the completion of the plan for our salvation. But in these end times, ushered in by the Son's redeeming incarnation, the Spirit is revealed and given, recognized and welcomed as a person. This is the time of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Catechism calls it these end times. Well, these end times, this is when we live. We're living in the end times right now. I mean, in some ways, an easy way that you could talk about it is, in the Old Testament, it was the age of the Father. It was when the Father revealed Himself as a Father. In the New Testament, we have Jesus revealed as the Son, and we see the work and the ministry of Jesus. But it's in the age of the church when the, the church is born at the Feast of Pentecost, this is when the Spirit is working and the Spirit is moving in these end times, the age, of the age of the church. This is our time. As we take a break now, I want you to look at some 
key scripture passages. There's actually a series of them that I'm going to have you read. I'll put them up on the screen here. I want you to read about Peter and see what the Holy Spirit did in the person of Peter. Those passages that you read about Peter, you see this incredible transformation that's taken place in him. I mean, it's it's almost like he's a a, a different person. Like, are, are you sure that that's really the same Peter? We see at the end of the Gospel of John, he's denying that he even knows Jesus. He's afraid. He's so afraid that he might get arrested and the same thing that's happening to Jesus might happen to him. He's huddled in the upper room after the the. Uh, After Jesus dies, he's huddled up there with all the disciples. They're all fearing for their lives. But then, just a couple of pages later, in the beginning of Acts, Peter's standing up in front of thousands of people, talking about Jesus, talking about how he knows him, about his relationship with him, and proclaiming that Jesus has risen from the dead. Wait a second, is this a different Peter? How is it possible that this is the same person? See, this is the transformation that the Holy Spirit can do in us. The Holy Spirit, uh, that fire of the Spirit, can transform us. He can take away our fears and can take away uh, the, the ways that we would be so hesitant to really follow God, to really respond to God with all of our heart. It's one of the things that the Spirit can do in us. We see a similar transformation that takes place like this back in the Old Testament. You have the story of David when he is anointed in 1 Samuel, he's anointed by the prophet Samuel, uh, and he's anointed to be the new king for the kingdom of Israel. And just a chapter later, what happens? David ends up going up to fight against the giant Goliath and, and defeats him. Well, we see this similar kind of anointing of Peter. Peter, who is all afraid and, and is, isn't, uh, isn't able to know what to do next, uh, we, we even read at, uh, in one of the Gospels how he went back fishing. He goes back to what he knew before. But after the Pentecost, Peter becomes a completely different person. And just like David was anointed and, and immediately goes out to fight against Goliath, Peter, in a certain way, is anointed to go out and fight against the enemy. And Peter is going to defeat the enemy in the name of the church. Well, this kind of transformation, this kind of anointing is one of the things that the Holy Spirit does for us. He animates us. We talk about how the Holy Spirit animates all creation. This is what it means. The Holy Spirit in us comes alive in us and and literally even sometimes can give us what we're supposed to say. I want to look at a passage with you. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear testimony before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you up, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. And those are great words of consolation to us. I mean, that's what happened to Peter When he stood up in front of those thousands of people right after the Feast of Pentecost, it was the Holy Spirit that came alive in him, that started speaking through him. And he spoke so authoritatively about all of the things that Jesus had done. And he spoke so powerfully, in fact, that it struck people to their hearts. You know, you may ask yourself the question, has the Holy Spirit ever moved in you? Has he ever helped you? Well, you know, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, It says, no one professes that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So if you've ever said that Jesus is Lord, then the Holy Spirit has moved in you and has brought about that conviction in you so that you could say that. What we see in Peter is the action of the Holy Spirit. We see the Holy Spirit transforming him and literally changing him into a new person. This is what we saw in the index of the catechism. All of those different ways that the Holy Spirit was moving moving particularly in that section on the economy of salvation. When you look at those ways that the Holy Spirit, uh, how he's the source of all holiness, the master of prayer, he leads a believer to faith and he leads us to understanding the scriptures. This is what the Holy Spirit does for us 
in our lives. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 9 and read verses 1 to 18 about the conversion of St. Paul. We're going to pick that up in our last scene. As we draw the study to a close, one of the things we want to wrestle with is, so what? What what does this all have to do with, with my life? You know, we've been asking the question, is the Holy Spirit really a person? I think we've really established that. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third person of the Holy Trinity. And because He's a person, we can have a relationship with Him. Just like we can have a relationship with God the Father and with God the Son, we can have a relationship with this person of the Holy Spirit. We want to ask the question, what does that look like? How how do I actually experience that in my life? That passage that you read from Acts 9, the story of Paul and his conversion, it's, it's a great image for us of how the Holy Spirit works in our life. You read in that story about how Paul was this character. It says he was breeding murderous threats against the Christians. He hated the Christians, and he wanted to see them in jail or dead. You know, just like that transformation that we talked about in Peter, Paul experiences the same kind of transformation. We literally see his name get changed from Saul to Paul. And Paul becomes one of the most significant evangelists in the whole history of the church. Two-thirds of the New Testament was written by St. Paul. And it all started with this powerful encounter with the Spirit of God as he was on his way to Damascus. Well, that kind of transformation can happen for you and can happen for me. This is what the Holy Spirit does in in our lives and in our time. The Holy Spirit is the indwelling of God's Spirit inside us. That's where the Holy Spirit lives and dwells. He dwells in our hearts. This is how we access God in prayer. This is how we communicate with God. This is how God can reveal uh, himself to us in ways that we can understand how how he wants us to go about our day-to-day lives. He speaks to us in the depths of our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Well, how about you? Do you want to say yes to a relationship to the Holy Spirit? Do you want to open your heart to that indwelling of the Spirit uh, that's really in you from your baptism? Would you like that Spirit to come alive in your heart where you can have a relationship with God through His Spirit, where God can reveal Himself to you in powerful, transforming ways for you in your life? It's been great being with you today. I'll be praying for you as you continue on your journey being disciples of Christ.